Hey everyone, welcome back. Here's the deal. We just learned a lot about the lore, so I'm not gonna do any faffing around. Let's just get stuck in. Well, no surprise here, Zoval is the original Arbiter. It's almost like we all just kind of put two and two together when we notice they both have big weird chest holes, plus a few other things. But anyway, this part of the lore is now confirmed via the Primus, who explained that Zoval defied the will of the First Ones, forcing his brethren to, uh, well, you know, bind him to the Maw because you can't be going around denying the will of the First Ones. So not only does Zoval have the power of the Arbiter, he also has the power of the Domination Magic via what the Primus did to him eons ago, as well as the Infinisigils, whatever they might do. And then, of course, whatever he finds in Zareth Mortis, the realm of the First Ones. So we're probably a bit screwed. Which makes me think, what about Zareth Mortis? What's going on there? What the hell is it? I'll tell you what Zareth Mortis isn't. It's not our Patreon, but our Patreon's pretty cool because we just published Lore Walking Episode 4 over there at the content tier, and there is a bunch more content heading up to the Patreon on the regular, where we've got our weekly podcast, we've got our monthly physical loot, and we've got a bunch more too, early access videos, so not only do you get a whole bunch of cool stuff, you also join the backbone of our operation and help the team out. And even just for the Lore Walking podcast, like, with that between them, we've got hours of evergreen content for you. So thanks for the support. And let's have a chat about Zareth Mortis because this thing gets weird and wacky and wild. Right, Zareth Mortis is revealed to us via a conversation between Venari and Tal Galan, who refers to it as the realm of the first ones. Well, what does that mean then? It could go many ways. The first ones, are, we think, cosmos-wise progenitors. And if that is the case, then you could see Zareth Mortis as not specifically being Shadowlands, instead, maybe being more their true home. If so, kind of expect the control room of reality. In a way, us getting our space jockey moment as if this was the Alien franchise. I mean, heck, if Zareth Mortis is the control room, then maybe Azeroth is the engine. I mean, what is that life-death cycle in the Broker Cosmology chart fueling where Azeroth is the middle of the Great Cycle? Could be that. But wait, Mortis. That's Latin for death. So I guess the first ones speak Latin. Hmm. It's also, and this is quite the find, in Star Wars Legends lore, and actually canon, something. So in Legends... Mortis is a planet within an ancient monolith that is the galaxy-wide conduit for the Force. In Star Wars canon, it's simply a realm that some say is within the Force, with others saying that the Force comes from it. And within it, within Mortis, there is a sort of ruling family. In their lore, there is a son that represents destruction, a daughter that represents life, cycle of death and rebirth, and a father who maintains balance. And funnily enough, Mortis is referred to as the fulcrum for the galaxy. The ever-living statuette in World of Warcraft says, the fulcrum wavers, which I imagine it would if Zoval is doing his thing. It's an interesting Star Wars parallel, especially because that father-daughter-son family that I mentioned, I think in Legends, they're referred to as the Ones. Okay, it's not the first ones, but the Ones. Come on, it's kind of close, right? Uh, and after a, a quick uh, tweet, Trace told me that uh, Mortis kind of represents creation and destruction, where the forces of the universe bleed into their own reality, where only the, the worthy may, you know, enter and learn. And narratively, it's all about ending, uh, you know, sort of like light and, and dark. So it's not so different from what's going on with World of Warcraft. So that's Mortis solved. Simply put, Mortis equals death literally as a translation, but maybe that Star Wars color isn't far off the mark. Maybe. As for Zareth, well, I've actually never met somebody called Zareth, but it turns out Zareth is actually a name. The one that means perplexity. So I mean, hey, Lore, are you laughing at us? 
perplexity. Come on. Um, now, Zareth is, however, within the Warcraft universe, defined, well, specifically in the Grimoire of the Shadowlands book. Uh, it's defined as either Keystone or Cornerstone. The author of Grimoire isn't particularly sure, but it seems to be one of the two. Well, Mortis sure does seem to be the cornerstone of the galaxy and the Force in Star Wars, and a very simple translation puts it as Cornerstone Death or Keystone Death. So, Cornerstone of Death, Keystone of Death. What's in a name? Hmm, quite a lot, it seems. So, maybe patch 9.1.5 will enlighten us. And maybe 9.2 will take us to Zareth Mortis, or maybe that will be a raid. Pretty sure we're going there, though. Well, now that we're done with Latin and Star Wars, the uh, end of the 9.1 campaign clarifies how soul shattering works. And this is very good to know, because our previous best source was a fairy tale, which, you know, certainly is canonical, but it's not 100% accurate, and frankly, our lore should mostly come from wow.exe and not amazon.co.uk. Well, Uther tells us that it's not a case of just his bad side and his good side being split. No, he says that it was as if a portion of his consciousness remained frozen in time, while the rest of his soul just continued on, right? So yes, this does mean that most of Uther carried on, but a bit of him was still stuck within Frostborn. Of course, that is a bit of his consciousness that is you know, locked in time, and also a bit of his personality will be tied up within that. Now, it's that Frostmourne bit of Uther that presumably is the bit that we met in Ice Crown Citadel, because Jaina meets Uther in patch 3.3. But that's weird, because when Jaina and Uther talk in patch 9.1, they say it's the first time they've met after Stratholm. So either Blizzard just forgot about the Ice Crown Citadel raid, well, the Ice Crown Citadel dungeons, or the Ice Crown Citadel Uther was like just a shade or something and not Uther Prime? Bit weird. Um, and it actually calls something into question. Um, I mean, soul mechanics aside, part of the point here is that that bit of Sylvanas that she got back was kind of locked up and frozen in time while the rest of her continued. Now, clearly that bit of her consciousness did contain balancing out parts of her personality, which is partially why she got more and more extreme over her time in Undeath. Though there is actually another reason for that that we'll get into very soon. Now, the core point is that when Sylvanas got her soul back at the end of the raid, that was her being reunited with a slice of her that was frozen in time. Now, the fairy tale refers to that fragment of her soul as courage, and we can safely say that it very much is the Ranger General we knew early in Warcraft 3 and the extended lore. And that means that when Sylvanas says he cannot reach, or whatever, at the end of that cinematic, what does he mean? Zoval can't reach the sepulchre, or Arthas cannot reach the sunwell? It's a neat question, and maybe even a plot hole or something, because if Sylvanas does say he can't reach, uh, you know, basically, if she, me if she meant Arthas can't reach the sunwell, then that does mean that the sole fragment bit of her is having all those memories. Now, that's a plot hole, if Uther gets reunited with his Frostmourne uh, fragment, but then doesn't remember that Jaina met him in patch 3.3. So that is, uh, that is a little bit weird. Anyway, with the soul frags, at least now we've got a bit of clarification on what Blizzard intent. Next, the revelation about Anduin that impacts Sylvanas. In a flashback, we see Sylvanas and Anduin discuss their next steps. Now, by this stage of the flashback, Zoval had dominated Anduin's will to take uh, three sigils, and Anduin had realized that each time this happened to him, he actually lost a bit of himself. And he asks Sylvanas if she felt the, the hollowness, the emptiness, and the darkness that he did within his soul, and Sylvanas says she did. So that is part of Zoval's magic. This darkness takes root in your soul, and it seems that if you're not careful, it will consume you. We've seen what that did to Sylvanas. Could even be a little part of why she ended up turning cold. Now, of course, it's Anduin's turn. 
And if he is already feeling this impact in his soul by patch 9.1, then surely patch 9.2 is going to have him reeling because how many more times does Oval have to dominate his will? I mean, with no Sylvanas to do his dirty work, Anduin will be Zoval's top instrument. So what is he going to return to us as? And what sort of king is he going to be? What damage will he take? I think quite a bit. Moving on then, the Dreadlords are finally back. What a fun bunch. And uh, the campaign's conclusion gave us yet another big bit of info. Here's the deal. We prevent Valganis from preventing us from making a new sigil for Revendreth. Great, a victory. We make our new sigil, but it's all a ruse because we defeat and we capture Malganis while his mates carry out the real Dreadlord plan, which is of course to save Denathrius. Now, like any good villain, Malganis of course enjoys a good gloat. Malganis, we need not be enemies. Join us to save Revendreth and end we your exile. We were never in exile, you gullible fool. It was all part of the Master's plan. <laughs> While you remained fixated on a paltry medallion, we seized the true prize, Remornia, with the Sire's essence held within it. Right, we knew about the formation of the Legion being part of a Dreadlord plan. We knew that Sargaris' fall was orchestrated by the Dreadlords, all this stuff we knew. And of course, the end result of the Burning Legion, when we think about it, is the Prime Narrow being destroyed, the Cosmos being wiped of life, the Burning Legion being defunct, and the Titans being locked up. I mean, that's a pretty damn good result for that plan, isn't it? For Argus then, well, we all remember the victory that went unnoticed line, don't we? Well, this uh, makes it very clear, doesn't it? Malganis says, destroying Argus was not serving the Void's plan. That was not the victory that went unnoticed, that it helped Nizoth or something. No, it was serving death. And that's hardly a surprise because Argus is literally called Death Titan in the game files. The Titans, you see, pretty much just milled about the place, um, building order out of what they saw around them. Of course, that was their perception of order. And the Titans each seem to have found a force that they, they took interest in. I mean, A&R and life is one example. Argus and death is another example. But Argus is obviously not true death, not proper death. He's this titan, a being of order, who is clearly the death titan, but actual death and mortality in the big cycle, that's the Shadowlands, right? So how does Argus factor into that? Maybe he played a key role in, uh, you know, what the broker cosmology chart calls the great cycle, just like how Azeroth clearly does. This may be something to dig into later. Few characters have had as tortured an existence as poor old Argus, so it'll be fun to find out more concretely what that all meant. I mean, come on, like, if the defeat of Argus is what destroyed the machinery of death, as an example, I mean, then what was Argus's point in the whole setup of the cosmos, right? I mean, there's big questions there. Anyway, getting back to the Red Lords. At this point, right, of that quest, we had thought that the Dreadlords served Denathrius, right? And that Zoval had betrayed Denathrius. And I think it was very reasonable to think that, that Zoval had betrayed Denathrius, um, because Blizzard's very own cinematic made it very clear that Sylvanas thought that Denathrius was being let down by Zoval. I mean, look at her reaction. Sire Denathrius has been taken prisoner. What is our plan to recover him? Every soul has its purpose. Genathrius has fulfilled his. We must forge our next weapon. He's not ready. Yeah, so actually not so much, maybe? 
shortly after the freeing of Denathrius, players mess around with an imprisoned Malganus, who, uh, you know, is a bit furious when we don't, of course, accept his offer of great power. Um, but of course, the joke's on us because he ends up escaping off screen. How? Nobody knows. But of course, always one to gloat, he leaves us a video message at the end of the campaign. And in that, it's, it's quite revealing. After he chastises us for not joining him, he says he's got more important matters to tend to, and the message ends. But the big thing is that whenever we turn in that quest, the completion text reads, it appears you and Malganus are not done with one another. When you finally confront the jailer, you are certain the Dread Lord will be there as well. So this is funky because it suggests that Malganus and his sire still serve Zoval. Even though Zoval, by Sylvanus' reckoning, betrayed Denathrius. Well, what if, uh, knowing her history, Zoval simply chose to just not tell Sylvanus about the Dreadlords and Denathrius, maybe? I mean, why have your chief task rabbit know about your big super evil spy network that everybody, of course, knows is evil? So it's, it's a bit weird, that thing. Either that, or, you know, Sylvanus actually is right, and Denathrius and his Dreadlords are actually free agents, and the player character is incorrect in assuming that when they finally confront the Jailer, that the Dreadlords will be there. Uh, but I, I will say this, Denathrius and the Dreadlords being free agents with a massive network and extensive knowledge, that definitely has more future narrative potential. But this is just a weird thing where the 9.1 campaign end very much makes it seem like Sire Denathrius and, uh, and the Dreadlords are on Team Jailer, but a previous cinematic really does make us think that we should think that Zoval betrayed Denathrius. So I guess it's the sort of thing that maybe Zoval didn't betray Denathrius and just tried to shut Sylvanas up and get her to forget about it because Zoval always knew that the Dreadlords would be there to try to rescue Denathrius and perhaps Denathrius counted on Renathal, or Denathrius and Zoval maybe counted on Renathal thinking that, uh, of course, Denathrius could, uh, you know, could sort of, well, go through the whole Ravendreth process and, you know, be a good boy again. Maybe that's what's going on there. We're gonna try to make that plot work out. But anyway, now for another plot. It's time for another revelation because we got even more Elune-related dialogue. Let's take a look. It was not until I heard Elune's voice that I recognized the grief buried beneath my anger. Sorrow intertwined with a deep sense of betrayal. When Teldrassil burned, I could not understand why the goddess did not intervene, why she would allow so many to be lost. But I did not know of Ardenweald, of the duty and purpose that awaited the souls of our people, at least before them all. Perhaps we can never truly know the ways of the gods, my daughter. But I believe Elune made a choice to aid her sister not to cause us sorrow. The Winter Queen faced hard choices as well. She and Mother Moon are bound together in an eternal cycle, one of death and rebirth. A cycle the Kaldori must now rejoin. No more looking to the past. It is time to embrace our future. Okay, well, there sure are ways to read that uh, little stay a while and listen scene. Chandra's explaining that she couldn't understand why Elune let Teldrassil happen until she learned of Ardenweald does kind of imply that Chandra thinks Elune let Teldrassil happen. And Chandra sort of seems okay with it? I mean, look, Elune did say, in the wake of tragedy. So it's less that she made it happen, and perhaps at the most more that she let it happen, and that then she did what she could for the souls. But it is odd that Tyrande doesn't challenge Chandris and say, no Chandris, Elune could not have stopped Teldrassil, but she did do what she could to soothe the suffering of our people. I mean, if Tyrande just said that, it would have clarified the whole plot 
and we wouldn't even be talking about this and stuff would just make sense. But instead, Tyrande just remarks that we can't truly know the way of the gods, but that she thinks Elune chose to aid her sister, not to cause them sorrow. Now, is that her saying that in accidentally ferrying souls to the Maw, she meant well? And of course, then that the sorrow is that bit with the Maw and uh, not Taldrassil? Maybe that's what she meant. We just don't know. And it's kind of the unfortunate result of characters having so little dialogue that is written, so little dialogue that is spoken, and then the words that do get into the game kind of just being cliffhangery and designed to incite speculation. And perhaps if this was a novel, that would make you want to turn the next page to find out the answer, and it would be a, a fun, gripping thing. But of course, it's not a novel. We have to wait months for the next bit of, uh, bit of lore. So there you go. That is uh, just a selection of the, the, the lore reveals and just things that I wanted to talk about now that the patch 9.1 campaign has drawn to a close. So I guess just let me know what are your thoughts, what are your speculations, what do you think's going on with Zareth Mortis, and hey, would you like this pretty cool staff pin, as well as some other real neat physical loot and, uh, you know, podcasts and early access videos and more stuff like that, including the daily briefing. You can check out the Patreon. Hey. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.